So, you want to try Dungeons & Dragons, but you've never had the opportunity. Welcome to the club, this is something I've heard like 50 times over the years, and it's really a breath of fresh air considering that as a kid, I spent so much of my energy trying to convince friends past puberty to play Dungeons and & Dragons, and it was all, oh that's for nerds, that's not cool. But luckily now we're living in a renaissance time where the amount of people who want to play Dungeons & Dragons is much higher than the amount who actually have the friend groups or the experience to do so. If you want to get in on this hyper-social, amazingly fun game that's currently exploding, then I'm going to run through a little bit about what to expect and if it's something you actually want to play, and also run through of how you can find a gamer friend group or convert your existing friends and be able to play amongst yourselves without pre-existing experienced players. I'm going to be starting off explaining what is Dungeons and & Dragons and role-playing games, but if you already know about this stuff and you're just more interested about how to get playing, how to find people, feel free to skip later into this video. So Dungeons & Dragons has already been rising in popularity with the rise of nerd culture in general, but this has been accelerated by that show Stranger Things that half of you are probably here because of, that really is bringing back the nostalgia and opening up the possibilities of this fun game. On top of that, a lot of celebrities are coming out of the closet like Vin Diesel, Dan Harmon, writers of Adventure Time and Rick and Morty. And Dan Harmon actually has a show, Harmon Quest, where it's a bunch of famous comedians who play in front of a live studio audience. So that may be something enjoyable to watch and to also give you a clue about what Dungeons & Dragons looks like. So what is Dungeons & Dragons and how to play it? Essentially, Dungeons & Dragons is a collaborative storytelling game where every player is essentially like the main character in a book or a movie, where you get to control that person to make your own decisions. It could be somebody like you or somebody very different. If you're playing like somebody like yourself, it's usually because it's comfortable or you just like being your style, but also Dungeons & Dragons would be a really good opportunity to grow and to push your bounds, think different ways, and often fake it until you make it could really well balance your personality or help you grow as a person. Simultaneous with all these players being able to make their own decisions, you have a game master, and they represent the world and the sort of secondary characters in a show or a movie. They describe what's going on in the scenes and the world, and the players decide what they want to do based on their character's motivations. And this is all governed by a simple rules system, where basically you have different stats for your intelligence and your strength and how nimble and tough you are, that often dictate a little bit about your decisions. Are you going to try to swim across the river or jump across it based on which one you're more skilled at or your natural propensities go towards? You can collect loot along the way and you get swords that modify stats, or in other RPGs, guns, magic powers, anything along those lines. And then it all gets boiled down to a dice roll, where that often determines your probability of success. If you give a really charismatic speech to free some prisoners, maybe the dungeon master or the game master will just automatically pass it or role play out as if they're the other party that you're competing with or cooperating with or they might even just give automatic passes for role-playing. Along the way, all, there can also be very advanced encounters where there's puzzles about combat. Some people play more in the theater of mind where there aren't even visual aids like a board or models, but it's just played in the collective imaginations, which speeds up the game a little bit and also places more attention on the fantasy. When the dice results are really low, sometimes comically horrible things happen with a critical failure. No! 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 And on the highest dice rolls, oftentimes you have amazing things happen on critical successes. So through a game of Dungeons and Dragons, you have all these different people there for different reasons. Usually there's a shared sense of wanting to progress and have camaraderie with other people. But beyond that, it's a lot of different elements of art. And that's why I think it's such a high form. Because there's acting, there's strategic thinking, there's just so many different kinds of things that go into this. You can have background music for props, models, the tactical combat. There's just so many different elements that make you really immersed in the story that once you're so into it, after a few hours or a few play sessions, or sometimes games last for years, meeting every week or two, then you can get really so bought into this world that these things that are happening in this fictitious story almost seem like real experiences. And I've seen people cry at touching moments or when their characters die because they're so bound to this world that it's almost like a piece of them dies. Oftentimes these role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons are played with books that have a lot of rules, but mostly the core rules are very simple and you can kind of wing it from there based on your common sense or whatever you feel like. But most of the content is actually a lot of beautiful illustrations and different options for characters if they want to go into becoming a barbarian or a ranger in the case of fantasy lands, or different kinds of stuff based on almost any environment. And it seems like almost every famous fantasy world nowadays has these games, including Game of Thrones. Usually you play this with about three to six friends for about three to six hours. I personally enjoy playing with four people as a magic number because when you have a game master and three players, it's enough to keep the story moving along and a lot of focus and attention on individual people while still having enough for politics where people won't always agree if there's just two people in a simple relationship. So back to the original topic. 
You want to play Dungeons and Dragons, but you've never had the opportunity. Most Dungeons and Dragons players are playing in closed groups of friends, so it doesn't really spread as virally as a lot of other things. In addition to that, a lot of these groups, it really matters who they play with, so they're very selective about who they invite. And it's especially true for not wanting to invite new players because it can slow down the group as people learn the mechanics and slow things down, maybe feel less comfortable about improvisation, how it works. But here's some tips about how to find these groups or at least convert your existing friends to be able to play. The first and best option is to convert your existing friends. And a great way to do this is just to show them, find some clips, I'll put some below. But once they see how much fun people have playing and what it's like, most people in general are just going to catch it like a disease and really want to dive in. It's really good to have someone who knows what they're doing playing, just to make it less awkward, go with the flow, be able to run the mechanics and answer questions. And with this, you can actually go on Craigslist and find people. There's Adventurers League by Wizards of the Coast, the people who make Dungeons and Dragons, maybe some other groups if you Google around. Even Meetup has groups, but these are super hit and miss. So if you're not converting your existing friends or you really want to just bring in a more experienced player or join a group, then the best thing I honestly recommend is Game Tree, the app that we've made, where you use your personality psychology, your tastes, and it matches by location and age, and not just to taste in Game Tree, but many other things. So there's a high chance you're actually going to get along, have compatible play styles, and really even just become real friends, which is ultimately what these sorts of games are all about. You can also play role-playing games online. There's a software called Roll20 that handles maps and voice communication software and groups and being able to save information over time. So that's a really good option if you can't meet with people face to face, but that really is the best way to play. I was playing in a game on Roll20 with actually a guy who lives in Mexico from America. And I just happened to be going to Mexico somewhat nearby him. So I actually got to meet him in real life and he hosted me in the rural parts of Mexico. And it was an amazing experience getting to see this person who I'd met online be able to get this sort of local connection with a relationship for somebody who's been living there for years. So that's a great example of how games can really connect us and give us a lot of opportunities and possibilities that we don't get in normal day life. Through playing Dungeons and Dragons, you'll find that it's a hyper, hyper social game. Despite this past stereotype that it's actually an antisocial one. It's all about interacting with other people so much to the point where you're basically sharing an imaginary hive mind world. And what you'll find through this is that actually the people you play with are the most important element of the game. It's not the setting, it's not your character, but it's the personalities of all the different kinds of joy that people bring to the table. Some people are so caught up in the lore and the story and just seeing their passion and their vibrancy for it really brings it to life. And other people are so strategic about different sorts of situations and resolving different sorts of arguments and persuasions that it becomes like a very epic puzzle where normally in daily life we might just have some sort of routine or some limited options, but in this you really get to live in the action in a way that nothing else offers. It's also a good way to connect and make new friends, whether it's through the game itself or a way to make relationships with people pre-existing. For example, in my personal life, I'll often cement friendships with people by inviting them to a Dungeons and Dragons game or a campaign. It's a great excuse to meet and to have people come over, we hang out for hours, and even through Game Tree, we've actually gone to events where we've organize lots of people playing together where it's just been such a positive experience where people make real friendships that they leave having shared these imaginary experiences. In our next video we're going to dive into the psychology of role-playing games with most of the examples being in Dungeons and Dragons which could be useful for you if you're deciding what kind of character you want to play the first time or what your own natural playstyle might be like compared to those of other people and especially if you're a games master then this gives you some tips about how to actually run the game based on the kinds of people who are playing it because different people enjoy different kinds of fun so by having an understanding of what people are trying to get out of the game, then you can have the best kind of experience by personalizing it to them, to you. We don't have to have funny bloopers every time. Oh, this one? I don't know how to sing that. I don't know how to sing this. She lost my feet, but I never